The Wagner mercenaries were so close to taking Moscow, they reached the outskirts of the Moscow Oblast, just about 100 miles away from the city centre. And the panic within Moscow was palpable. It was recorded on Telegram that the police generals were holding an emergency meeting in the Interior Ministry in Moscow, readying the city's defences. The police and National Guards were set up with machine gun posts at checkpoints outside the city with sandbags. They knew the police forces were useless against the veteran Wagner soldiers. Everyone knew this. Moscow was in paralysis. Former Wagner soldiers inside Moscow were also being rounded up and the generals were talking among themselves how to serve the Prigozhin regime. This is all very worrying. Outside Moscow, Chechen units sent to outflank the Wagner soldiers in Rostov were also surrendering. Voronezh, Kursk, Lipesk, um, Tambov and Tula right outside of the Moscow Oblast fell incredibly quickly. Furthermore, attempts to stop the Wagner column using airstrikes were very futile. There was one recorded successful hit, but with all the experienced units in Ukraine, the accuracy was very dismal and they lost seven aircraft, an almost unprecedented number for a single day. And yet, with the victory almost in sight, Prigozhin announced that Wagner would pull back. Putin had allegedly fulfilled all of Prigozhin's demands, including uh, promising to remove Shogu and Jerosimov, and with the pardoning of all the Wagner soldiers who participate in the rebellion and the folding in of the remaining soldiers into the Russian army. Prigozhin would also be sent to Belarus. Some things just don't make sense to me with the information that we have right now. Why would Prigozhin give up when victory was so close? Did he not get the overwhelming support, especially from other Russian oligarchs, soldiers and military commanders that he was hoping for? Was taking Moscow never part of the plan and when the opportunity presented itself, did he hold back like how Hannibal did after winning the Battle of Cannae? Were Rome's walls just too daunting? And it's also believed that the final straw to push Prigozhin into starting the coup in the first place was the Russian Ministry of Defense's announcement earlier in the month ordering Wagner's soldiers to sign a contract with the Russian military and thus dissolving Wagner as an organization in itself. However, the result of these negotiations where Prigozhin seemingly had all the power seems to have led to the exact same result. Some Something isn't making sense here. Something else to address from yesterday is, um, did Putin and Lukashenko actually flee their uh, respective residences? Well, we kind of know, but we also don't know. Lukashenko does appear to have flown to Turkey and met with Erdogan, and Erdogan did also allegedly have a phone call with Putin, offering him help. Putin's foe, Leonid Nevzlin, also suggests that Putin went to hide in a bunker in Valdai, close to St. Petersburg. Lukashenko, with 20 years, of um, friendship with both Putin and Prigozhin then mediated the talks, which is interesting because the Putin-Lukashenko power dynamic forever has um, been Lukashenko having uh, being the junior partner, but now Putin pretty much owes all his power and perhaps even his life to the Belarusian leader. But now the immediate emergency has subsided. What are the takeaways? Will this chaos help Ukraine? Well, Putin's current plan to win this now very long war is to outlast the enemy. This is the same strategy Japan used in World War II. They knew they couldn't compete with the full industrial might of America, but if they could just break the American public's will to put up with the hardships and their uh, will to fight, America could fold and Japan would win this war. As for Putin, with the Ukrainian counteroffensive not doing quite as well as expected, Putin was hoping that the West would eventually lose the will to fight, seeing the sacrifice of billions of dollars is pointless and start looking at diplomacy and making concessions of land instead to stop the war. For without Western supplies, Ukraine cannot fight effectively. However, after the events of yesterday, the status quo, while um, seemingly reinstated, the emperor has been caught with no clothes on and Putin's weakness is on full display. The aura of invincibility has been shattered. He's just an old man. And despite promising yesterday the worst to befall these traitors, the concessions he's made to basically forgive everyone is frankly very shocking and truly demonstrates how weak he is. There's also a bit of a missed opportunity here. If the rebellion went on for a bit longer and if Putin was able to prosecute Prigozhin, he could have had a very easy out of the war, blaming Wagner for Russia's defeat. This situation instead looks um, incredibly unstable and the less 
stable Russia looks, the more hopeful the leaders and the voting public are in the West, and the belief that the aid to Ukraine has been effective and is worthwhile, leading to more being sent. This throws Putin's current plan to win the war completely out the window. To make it worse, with Putin's handle on internal politics slipping away, despite the failure of the rebellion, Prigozhin has perhaps set a new precedent and has created a model that can inspire many others to follow. Showing how easy it is to march on Moscow, I keep referring back to the Roman general Sulla who marched on Rome, but it's very relevant after he broke the taboo of marching on Rome. Inspired by Sulla, everyone would start doing the same, most famously Caesar himself when he crossed the Rubicon. Putin's analogy yesterday of the situation being like the Romanovs in 1917 may soon be very prophetic. This could honestly be the start of his fall. Putin may have won the battle, but it may be a very pyrrhic victory. Thanks for watching.